And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hello, everyone out there in Tampa Bay and beyond. This is James Knowles coming at you for the RBLR Sports Podcast. I am here with my uh, regular guest from recently, my little Meowdies representative, DB, over here. But I am not here with my usual co-host, Carlos. He is unavailable this week, so instead we have producer Eureka in the house. Eureka, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, it was a you know bittersweet uh, weekend for me. You know, obviously the Rowdies uh, couldn't couldn't convert, but uh, uh, my other team that I love so much, Roma, did. They got the three points for Serie A, so they're on a pretty good start to their season. So you know, hey, eh, you win some, you lose some. Hey, you got to take what you can get in this sport, and probably all others. I am uh, only following one, and this week we are only talking about one because this is the Rowdies version of the RBLR Sports Podcast. So I guess we might as well just go ahead and get into it. Uh, this past Saturday, the Rowdies unfortunately did lose again, this time away to Colorado Springs Switchbacks. It was yet another 1-0 loss, and we are now on a two-game streak of that result. Not exactly what you want, but... Um, yeah, that's, that's like I said, what you got to deal with sometimes. Neither Carlos nor mm. I get any points for our predictions for this past game, but uh, we have another chance to make some predictions because, Eureka, we have a huge game this weekend coming up at home versus Orange County. Yes. Uh, it'd be good to get some revenge against uh, the, the, the people who came in here and snatched our uh, USL Cup from us. Yeah, I think that that's actually a pretty good way to look at it. But, yeah. you know, we're going to get into that a little bit later. We got a little bit more to cover before we can talk about moving forward with the next weekend's game. So before we start anything else, please follow at RBLR Sports. You can do that on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. You can do it on all three if you'd like. And please, of course, like and subscribe to our podcast on all major podcast platforms. Uh, Eureka, if you would like, please Take us away through this quick recap, and then we'll move forward with our questions and our analysis section. Yeah, uh, I wish it was a tale of two halves, but it wasn't. Uh, I guess if we're, we'll get into the the eleven because there was, I don't know. There's a couple guys. That, I mean, we're we're going to talk about some of this, but there was a, a specific game plan that I think Neil was trying to accomplish with this eleven, uh, and that. Uh, was uh, Cochran in in net uh, with White, Scarlet, Antley, and Guillen as a kind of a back four with Hilton, Ekra, Dayon Harris starting, uh, Greg on the other side with Fernandez and Dalgard also up top. So uh, very specific, I think, tactic with putting Harris out there, the speedy winger, right? We we've seen this this Colorado Springs side. Kind of, uh, they they really, really struggled uh, in the last couple weeks against that. Uh, then on the bench, you had uh, Breno Castellanos uh, returning but not starting in the second game here. Uh, Etu, Law, M. Casana, Dos Santos, and La Cava. And noticeably, not a Sebastian Guenzotti sighting on the bench for a second week in a row. Uh, the first half was, uh, I don't want to say uneventful, but it was pretty... The biggest thing you, you should pull out of that is the, the a lot of whistles, a lot of yellow cards. Uh, five on their side, two on our side, if I have my uh, my count right, but... Yeah, I think, uh, that was, I think that was one of the bigger halves for discipline we've ever seen. It was a lot. I mean, it was a lot, a lot. Uh, and... You know, maybe they were just being a little aggressive on defense, but, uh, I mean, you're just tackling people all over. We, we'll get into to some of that. But uh, the second half, only saw one goal. We saw one goal the entire game, and that was in the 66th minute from uh, Henriquez of Colorado Springs, and that uh, will probably draw a lot of discussion between us tonight. Uh, just... Overall, a disappointing effort. Even Neil calling out uh, the... The, the performance of the team and now it's been two weeks in a row that we have been unhappy with our performance on the field so uh, a lot to get into this is not a fun time happy rainbows and sunshine episode unfortunately James I, I don't think so yeah I, I I tend to agree it was um uh, pretty I, I I well we're gonna get into it but um yeah 
Uh, at the moment, I'm kind of struggling to tell which of the last two games was actually the worst one. But let's let's mm. get off mm. with this game first and talk about that before we try to discuss yeah. if we're seeing any larger patterns than you know maybe just a one off here. So yeah, yeah, let's let's start with this game and um, what went wrong first? What did you see out there, Eureka? Uh, what you said that you mentioned, you know, there was a possible strategy to what we yeah. had with this lineup. So what did you see out there? You know, you're going four in the back, and Colorado Springs has struggled with three in the back, and that's sort of our bread and butter. And for Neil to put out Greg and Harris, as opposed to LaCava, Dos Santos, uh, and then, uh, you know, wherever Sebastian Winzotti is, is, is nowadays, um, but putting four in the back with defense, you have you have Wyke, who can pressure upfield on offense uh, as a player as we move into transition, but... Um, I think that just didn't work. I just the putting Harris out there, putting Greg out there, they just weren't they weren't effective in the especially in the first half. I mean, uh cuz we didn't possess the ball and a lot of our game plan I think is we are a high possession team. Uh even if we don't dominate with like two thirds possession, we still usually have most of the possession in the game and we use that to for the, the in this particular lineup, you would think crosses and penetration from Harris and things like that. And we just didn't see it, uh, for, in, in my opinion. Um, and I guess Colorado Springs' defense was was uh, better than than anticipated, for sure. Uh, they controlled the ball on offense, especially in the first half. And they, when they were on defense, that's when they were, I mean, they're shoving, they're fouling, they're sliding, they're they're doing, they're literally biting, clawing, and scratching to do anything they can to stop the Rowdies on offense. And I think that if we had a bigger presence up front with the Dos Santos, if we had, uh, you know, maybe just a little different plan of attack, um, that things maybe would have been a little different. But that's that's one man's opinion. What... Uh, and we'll get into the second half, but what, what did you see in the first half that you think uh, kind of wasn't going our way? Yeah, so um, just based on what you were saying there, I want to take it back a little bit yeah, to a please. point that we made in the week before when we were doing our preview of this game. So going back through our own notes to that preview, um, I'm going to read it here. In several of those games, this is talking about Colorado Springs and their prior record, they scored three plus and. And in all, all, we're talking about the five games before they played the Rowdies, they conceded three plus. So they conceded at least three goals in all five games that the Rowdies played before, or, or that Colorado Springs played before they played the Rowdies. So, um, I mean, that, that kind of says something in and of itself. I, I don't think, yeah. yeah, as you said, our attacking options did not work. Um, I was, um, I was very... I don't know exactly how to temper this. I think Deion Harris and Sebastian Dalgard in the first half were effectively not out there. And then they came back more so in the second half. But I really didn't see that either of them created much of anything in that first half. I think that the people who were ultimately responsible for the majority of our successful crosses were either Lawrence Wyke or Aaron, excuse me, <laughs> not Aaron Skian, but Lawrence Wyke and Aaron Gian. And uh, Dayon Harris and Sebastian Dalgard both tried several times to get themselves into good positions and then failed to get an accurate cross off or uh, failed to beat the man. In yeah. fact, I remember there was one point in the game and uh, I will get an, I will get the minute here. It was between the 26th and the 34th minute. So it was Dayon Harris down the wing. And my note is not enough from him down the wing goes yeah. down in the box as if hit in the face and a totally weak call for a penalty there. So yeah. I don't know if you remember that instant, uh, that instance, Eureka, but it was pretty indicative of really how Harris's whole game went. He eventually, you know, he had a lot of trouble getting past um, the first guy. I don't know if it was always, you know, bad touches or whatever, but if he did get past the first guy, there was uh, the chance that he would break into space, you know, in the channels behind that defender usually going down what would be Colorado Springs switchbacks left side. 
and then he would uh, try and get across it. And this is what we, you know, expect from Dayon Harris. But that moment right. was a perfect encapsulation of everything that happened for him in that game because he actually did beat a man. It took a little bit, but he did beat the man. He got down there and he got himself into a position where if he got a cross off, it would probably turn into something because he was already in the box, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, Dayon Harris's opportunity turned into he went down as if he had been hit in the face. The referee didn't even care. And this was in the first half when he, as you said, he gave out seven uh, seven yellow cards, was it? And yeah. um, if yeah. you're not getting a penalty call under those circumstances, then, I mean, you know, you kind of got to give up the game there. It's th That's obviously not what we're looking for. Um, Sebastian Dalgard, I don't have the specific numbers on him for the first half. Um, I wish that we had been able to break it down that way, but I did not see it live, so I couldn't actually do that at the time. But yeah, yeah. his his numbers were crosses were obviously not good either. Kyle Gregg was, uh, I mean, how many times did he touch the ball in the first half, Eureka? I would say it was probably at least uh, definitely under 20, possibly under mm -hmm. 10, but definitely under 20 touches for the whole of the first half. And if you are trying to go up against one of the weakest defenses in the league right now, that's absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, uh, uh, to get a little bit more into Harris Dalgard and, 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 and things like that. I mean, look, Harris's best attribute is his speed, uh, and he, uh, which is phenomenal. Like, when we see him at this, his peak, but if he's not penetrating from the side and beating someone on a sprint, he's a smaller player, and, and if he's not getting past that – he only had two crosses in the entire game, you know, like, so, I mean, you're basically just trying to get the ball to him to, to work his own one-on-one -on -one, uh, around, a, around the guy to get around the wall or something and then either create for himself or make a great pass to someone else in the box. And it's, I mean, not, uh, it's kind of the one thing they do. They do. It's it. It's it. So however you're game playing against that, I mean, I, I guess you got to give kudos to, to their back line, for, for kind of stalling or for thwarting that effort. But again, it's, it's, I mean, we, we cover the team every week. So we kind of like, Oh yeah, that's what they're going to do. I mean, when you see Harris in the lineup, it's like, Oh, well, it's almost like I know exactly what the entire offense is going to be because uh, especially when you take out LaCava or you take out Dos Santos, it's like, Oh, well, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to try to run past everybody. And usually you would think that would work it because it has on, on occasion and, and especially against this defense. I think I think maybe the fan base or, or us, we had an elevated sense of our our own ability to score against this lowly uh, this team that concedes all these goals. Oh, my God. They you know, we're going to score five goals on these guys. Um, and they negated Harris's speed. Uh, Dalgard. Unfortunately, you know, again, we can only look at his total numbers, but but overall, I, th I think it was a, a, a below average game from him. He just wasn't dominant in any area. I mean, it wasn't all completely bad, but it wasn't dominant in any one area. And so when you, you've taken out Harris and you've taken out Dalgard, it means the switchbacks could focus on Leo Fernandez. Rightfully so, you could you can mark him, which you should because he's just on a complete tear. And he, to me, was the only... Uh, offensive plus in this game. I mean, yeah, uh, he was killer as advertised, but he's not Superman, and uh, and Greg really couldn't make anything happen up top with him. Uh, in, in a couple cases, Leo actually, Leo actually, this I mean, there was one particular chance that Leo absolutely created, gives it gives it to Greg, and on one touch, just he, he couldn't make it happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, so it's our own lame production on offense when we thought we were going to come into this game. I, I think we all thought that we were going to come into this game and score three goals or, or more, you know, uh, it, it, now you, you don't want to be overconfident, but we definitely, I don't think uh, you or Carlos or anyone else in, in the, in the Rowdies nation thought that we were going to score zero goals uh, on the road. I certainly did not. Um, yeah, I, I, I had better for that. I think that Leo was, as you said, the only player who was really um, effective in any movements at all. And I would say he still also had a down night. It just wasn't as down as everybody else, probably. But um, yeah, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is we are 38 minutes in at this point that I have this note down. Yeah. Uh, we are 6-4-0 on shots. I'm sorry. 
the game is 6-2-0 on shots with Colorado Springs switchbacks obviously having those six. I mean, yeah. how, how, obviously that is that is not what the Rowdies are used to. There was no real offensive effort, and I don't know exactly where, um, you know, I don't know exactly where the disconnect was in terms of the uh, ability to do that. Now, Dayon Harris was effectively marked out of the game because I think that you can put Dayon Harris off of his runs if you get to him before he can start the run and Colorado right. Springs switchbacks did that a lot. You know, they fouled him a couple of times and it was a couple yeah. of those fouls that they took yellow cards. But, yeah. um, you know, if you can do that, then you can mostly put off the uh, danger of his runs. And like I said, yeah, that, that was a big part of it for him. But um, yeah. even when he was able to do so, he was definitely having an off night in terms of the execution when he actually did get to the end of the line. So, you know, it didn't just come down to their effective game plan so much. And, uh, the other thing was, especially in the first half, so we'll break this up in the first and the second half here, but yeah. in the it's first half, the second, yeah. yeah, in the first half, additionally, what I saw was we had talked about last week how Haji Berry is obviously a very important player for them, and he is. Um, he was very good at a couple of instances. He would make runs that are, you know, very deep behind our back line where they just had to play him the ball and he had to run onto it. And that was, you know, that was effectively what needed to be done. And he did that a couple of times to good effect, but ultimately it didn't lead to any goals in the first half, as we noted. Um, yeah. The players who were in charge of marking him, uh, it's not that they didn't do a good job when they were close to him. There were a couple of times that he got the ball in between lines where you could say somebody should have been closer to him. Uh, but none of those, I don't remember turn into any uh you know large chances i don't remember that those were uh the the important parts of the game with haji berry involved it was definitely when haji berry had the room well behind our line to run into you know you know close to our corner flag and uh that was where he would try to get the ball and then bring it back to somebody often elvis amo who was starting on the left or mitchy and galena who was starting on the right and um, yeah, they were they were both very heavily involved. Actually, there were a lot more involved in the second half, but um, you know they were still racking up a lot of a lot of touches in that first half, and they were still getting everything done there. That um, you know, I, I don't think that the Rowdies didn't game plan for them. Obviously, I just think they didn't game plan properly for what Barry Amo and Ungolina ultimately brought to the uh, brought to the field that day. Yeah, this was a, again, you put the lineup the way you put it out there, and it's it's one to me that is very, very, uh, it's necessitated by possession. And unfortunately, you know, we'll get into some of this, I guess, a little later, but like, uh, to me in the midfield, when you see, uh, like, Hilton and Ekra, to me, are like, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't want to say they're a detriment defensively, but they're definitely more offensive uh, minded guy. Like, like it, when we have the ball, there's no better person than Hilton to create, you know, these long balls to the side to, like I said, I get what I, when I see the 11, I see like, man, if Hilton makes us outlet pass a long ball to, to a streaking Harris. Oh my God. No one can, no one can even do, you know, figure this out, and then you have Leo right up the middle, or Dalgard even in the, uh, in the box to catch these crosses. Boom, here we go. And then maybe in the second half, you you switch that up with a uh, Dos Santos uh, with his size and Lacava, you know, uh, to come in to either add to Fernandez or maybe to give Fernandez a spell if he's too tired from scoring all the goals in the first half. Um, but that just didn't happen because we didn't have the ball. No. Now you now you you're you're you know, uh, you're kind of at a disadvantage where they're able to go right up the middle of the field, and that's where Haji Berry just wrecks shop, man. I mean, he's the MVP. He's he's the dude that, you know, uh, he he's he he's a creative goal scorer. He knows what he's doing. He's good on the touch, and he's and and uh, again, I have a longer rant about this, but the back line just didn't work this game and, and unfortunately they had the Colorado Springs switchbacks had so many opportunities to poke and prod and 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 get you know in between and and beyond our back line and our midfield defense so uh, just it's just the first half was was 
um, I know we're, we, I think we were all looking at this like, we're just waiting for us to break through. I don't think anyone was down at the half. It's just that, like, uh, I mean, I even made a joke about, like, oh, the switchbacks are leading 5-2, to two, but in goals, it's tied. You know, like, we're joking about the yellows, and, and, and we're just waiting for this, like, the Rowdies to, I don't, I don't know, well, wake up or something. But we're like, eh, I, I felt confident at the half that something would happen. Um, but I, I guess it was on rewatch that I was like, now that I know the result, it's like I went back to that first half and was like, no, they're picking us apart. They're playing with such intensity. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're really bringing it to us. And in the moment, I guess I didn't really see it as much. Um, so, but it, watching it live, I wasn't that down. But now I see that that this was the game plan: rough us up, you know, poke us, stop the speed, own the ball at all costs, and basically negate all of the strengths of, of the Rowdies. Yeah, and um, I want to move now into the second half here because yeah, things were different, but uh, ultimately yeah. the the I guess you could say the result was more negative because we did give up a goal. But <laughs> yeah. let's talk yeah. about how it looked in terms of patterns because Leo Fernandez, I would say, was much more active or maybe not active, but um, much better in the second half. Sure. Now, I did not see a ton of upgrade from Harris and Dahlgaard. Now, Dahlgaard did do better in this one but it still wasn't obviously enough and it was not proper to the game that we were trying to execute there uh when dayon harris went off he went off for jake lacava i think that jake lacava obviously is a perfectly good uh player to try and bring on to create something up top we definitely needed that and uh steven dos santos came on for kyle greg at the same time later on like uh towards the 70 fifth minute, somewhere around there. Nikki Law came on for Jan Ekra and Lucky for Jordan Scarlett. And then with like five minutes to go, Junior Etu came on for Lewis Hilton. So those were the substitutions that were made. Keep that in mind as yeah. we talk through this. But um, yeah. what I saw in terms of attacking patterns in this uh, second half, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, uh, Eureka, but what I yeah. saw specifically was, again, the Rowdies really didn't have much going forward except for every so often somebody would try to go on a run on their own uh Mm. and that included connor antley at one point but mostly it was Mm. leo fernandez um i didn't see even a ton of this from jake lacava you know i think that he is more known for it than he showed in this past game and uh for the colorado springs switchbacks i saw a different game plan from the first half where elvis amo and mitchy and galena they were um the ones who were allowing space for Haji Berry to run into. So this time in the second half, I saw that their back line would instead try to find Elvis Amo and Michi Ingolina, where they were hugging the touchline in between the players who were on those wings. So on the left, it was Aaron Guillen and Sebastian Dalgard and Michi Ingolina would play right on the end line, trying to receive the ball from their back line, and then he would be, like I said, in between those two players. When Aaron Gian then stepped to him, what he he would look up immediately, receive the ball, and try and play a uh, a through pass to Haji Berry to run onto in between uh, yeah. Gian and Antley, who he was playing off of Antley's shoulder, and you know try and make sure that it was short enough that uh, CJ Cochran obviously wouldn't get there. On the left side, their left yeah. side, it was Elvis Amo who was playing on the touch line, and he was in between Lawrence Wyke. And, uh, you know, at different points, it was Dayon Harris or Sebastian Dalgard when he switched over to the other side. But um, then Elvis Amo would do the same thing. He would receive it. He would look up and he would try and play a through ball to Haji yeah. Berry. And Haji Berry did this multiple times where yeah. um, he was able to step out, pull somebody out and go to the ball there with, you know, this, the speed that we talked about him having last week. And then he yeah. would try to cut the ball back. Now, in one of those instances, um, it was uh, over to Elvis Amo, I believe, on the left side, and uh, or I'm sorry, no, I have it on the I have it on the wrong side. But the play started out the out at the back, and it went right up to the right wing where uh, Mitchy Ingolina was sitting. So uh, he found Haji Berry with that through ball, and mm-hmm. then Haji Berry split uh, multiple players to find Ingolina uh, right mm-hmm. there, like we were mentioning. And uh, his shot was actually saved because he went through on uh, the back. He went through on the back post when everybody set to Haji Berry. And yeah. when his shot was saved, the rebound was actually turned in by Steve, by 
uh, Jairo Enriquez, excuse me, and Jairo That's Enriquez correct. was coming into the box late just in yeah. case any of those spills happened. And so they did. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was it was um, something that they were trying to do in, you know, one way or another, obviously not every single play is going to come down the same, the exact same way, because that's not how soccer works. It's going to be a little bit more improv than that, but that was a pattern that they were trying to execute as far as I saw it. And it definitely worked for them like very well. Yeah, no, uh, pinpoint analysis there, uh, James, cause it's, it, it's exactly what happened on the, the goal that was scored that you just, you talked about. Cause basically it's a stretch out the four, you know, uh, like you said, working side to side, and then it they just they broke through with that particular play. I think Aaron Guillen got absolutely smoked by that pass from from Haji Berry, uh, because and and some of it is because you're marking Haji Berry, right? So so you he gets the ball, you know, uh, quite a ways uh, away at the top of the box, but he's still on the wing, and I think you start floating over like his gravity brings you over. And then Guillen just gets, which we've seen now, unfortunately, in a, in a few games here, just gets absolutely smoked uh, by the by the uh, defender who's penetrating on his side. Barry connects with a phenomenal pass right to him. Uh, the guy gets maybe one or two touches, fires it on Cochran, which uh, we'll, we'll get. In, uh, I have a, you know, I want to say a lot about C.J. Cochran a little bit later, but uh, Cochran makes a great, uh, you makes a good save, point blank range. Unfortunately, he can't keep it; it gets deflected. But you know, again, it's like he he got shot with a shotgun from ten feet out, um, and it's deflected right to a streaking and completely unmarked Enriquez because. Uh, uh, on first glance, I I was even more down. I thought that Barry kind of like gave him on a give and go kind of thing, where he made the play and then walked right in. But no, it was Henriquez who was just sprinting from midfield. Uh, you know that's what the play is designed to do: pick up the rebound, pick up the pieces, make the play. And the Rowdies literally just watched him do it. I mean, it was it, it was a horrible, horrible uh, lapse in in defensive play from first, uh, in, in my opinion, Aaron Guillen, and then the rest of the team. Just no one marked Enrique as he just was able to dead sprint right into the box, yep. uh, make one touch, and now we have a a, a one zero result. And um, yeah, they just they switch up their their plan a little bit, but I, I think that you know they kind of poked and prodded in the first half. They figured out what they wanted to do, and they came out in the second half and absolutely executed it uh, perfectly at least one time. And in this game, that's all they needed. Yeah, and um, this game that was all they needed. And I do think we have to discover or discover <laughs> we have to discuss something else. Um, there was one more really important talking point in this game where uh, in the 90th minute plus two in Mm. extra time, Mm, mm, there was mm. an extremely obvious call for a penalty that Mm. I, I mean, I I get that, you know, it's hard to do in real time. And I understand that they don't have VAR, but I I really don't know how three referees don't catch Mm. that because Mm. I, I mean, I guess, you know, Diego Maradona did it in, in uh, another, (laughs) in another lifetime yeah. Um, it was done at a world cup and you know, that's, that's yeah. a much bigger stage one could argue, but, um, I, I still fail to understand how nobody caught that. Uh, if we had had a penalty, you know, obviously there's no guarantee that that is scored and that we get a point out of this, but, um, you know, really, uh, uh, as it went, I would say that Colorado Springs deserved to win this game for one thing. And I think if we had got that penalty call and if it had gone in, you know, we'd all be thanking the Lord that we had a point out of this, but I think that we would all be like, you know, we 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 got away with something after this, the way that it went. And we didn't get the call, which is unfortunate. You know, I, I think that's total crap that we didn't get that call for sure. But at the same time, you know, on on par for the game, it was still a deserved scoreline in the end. It was still a deserved result. You know, maybe yeah. we maybe uh, we get a little luckier, and that's what top teams do. Obviously, they do get that luck sometimes when they're not playing their best. Um, that's something that commentators bring up frequently. But yeah, I, I I'm I'm upset that we did not get the penalty. And at the same time, I recognize that uh, us getting that penalty would have been very generous for the results of the game overall. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, digging a little deeper here, you know, uh, Law actually gets a free kick above the box. The the Rowdies' offense had way more chances, had way more opportunities, uh, especially once once uh, Greg and Harris got subbed out for LaCava and Dos Santos. That was exactly what the doctor ordered, 
And so for at least one third of the game, we had uh, better offense. We had better possession. We had better chances. Um, it, it, well, and uh, unfortunately, the goal came right as uh, Dos Santos and Cava came in. But again, we, we talked about it at length. They weren't the reason defensively that that happened. No. Um, but the response to that was, was very was very good, where for the next 20 something minutes, you saw. Dos Santos with multiple headers with, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, the Cava wasn't able to, to 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 be as creative as you want. But but now at least they had to pick a poison and uh, we had a, a tall, strong target man that was that was getting it done. That's why we're, we're making these chances. We're pushing the ball. We're getting it going. And, and Law gets a free kick above the box. And so we're I, I think we're all a, a little bit more. um well, this is what we've seen the Rowdies do, man. They go into, like, hyper mode. You know, they go into, like, from the 70th minute 70th minute on, you know, this is where we see Lucky M. Kasana magic happen and stuff like that. So we're used to kind of like, okay, we've ramped it up, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, once Law makes that free kick, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but uh, 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 both a Rowdy and a switchback are both going up for the header. Um, and it's... I mean, it's absolutely punched away by Mahoney. Well, it's Mahoney of, of Colorado Springs. Mahoney absolutely punches it. And I mean, maybe it's like his hand is right where where the face of, of our guy is, like to make the header. So it sort of looks like he heads it, you know, wrong into the stands or something. But like... Like you said, there's three different people with three different vantage points that that sh- that should be. I don't know what they're looking at because it's right at the line where you would be looking for offsides or whatever. I mean, it's 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 plain as day. At all like pretty much every person in a in a Volt uh, yellow uh, Rowdy's kit is like surrounding the referee. Yeah. Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? What are we doing? Uh, and we don't have VAR, uh, un- unfortunately, at this level, but. Uh, it was sad, but but Neil even said in the post game that you know, um, e- even the result wasn't as indicative of the the truth of this game. Uh, I'm putting words in his mouth, but that's basically what he said: is like one nil. It shouldn't have been one nil, right? Like it should be. We should have lost this game by more than we did. Thankfully, we have a keeper that made amazing saves. Um, but it just it just wasn't enough. And, and even the handball. Like even if we get the handball and and Leo gets to kick up, if we would have dragged our feet through a one one draw that we got at the ninety second minute because of a handball, um, that it's it wouldn't. I mean, I guess we get the point. Let's go. I mean, t- take them wherever you can get them. But we'd still be having the same exact uh, uh, episode. And I think there's there's a, still a couple things we we we're, we'll get into to pick apart this thing as we move forward. But um, even if they would have got the handball, even if they would have converted the PK resulting from that, like I don't think we would have been very uh, enthusiastic or happy about pulling, you know, snatching a draw from the uh, from the jaws of defeat, right? Yeah, exactly. That that's what it would have been. You're 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 dead on there, and um, you know we still would have had ninety plus minutes to go through about how the game mm. was kind of kind yeah. of bad <laughs> beforehand, yeah. but um, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, we've gone through the first half and the second half now. Um, Eureka, I don't want to skip past anything that you haven't talked about that you would like to. So say yeah. so now, or I would like to ask you, um, you know, is this four bad halves in a row that we've seen effectively? Yeah, this is this. Is, we're on the same page here because, look, it's two two weeks now. You, you had mentioned it earlier. You know, you basically could take the notes that we put about Louisville and put them right here. Um it's two weeks of lame production, and we've already talked about the wingers. Uh, we talked about maybe a gambit that that Neil wanted to put out in the first half. It didn't work. It took sixty six minutes to make the big changes, but he did make them, and unfortunately, it didn't it didn't happen in this one. But, um, w- w- you know, we called it an off night against Louisville, and Louisville was a huge game on the road in front of what would we say thirteen thousand people, fourteen thousand people, or whatever. That was as close as you're going to get to a cup final for some of these players at this level, and it was an off night in Louisville. Okay, but now it's now it looks like a trend. Two weeks now, we've had a team impose their style, and we are reactive to it. Um, 
we, uh, you know, and we've talked, I, I've already kind of talked about Hilton and Acura, but, uh, and, and well, and, and to kind of double down on that is like, Hilton actually made a really good defensive play and created a Fernandez drive that he dribbled through the box and, and got a really good chance. So, so if we were able to just get a little bit more on defense, uh, it would have created the opportunities that we needed on offense. And, uh, the big one to me this week is the back line, is the big story for me. Our back line is good. I'm not saying we need to, like, there's not much we can do, but but there was a lot of bad this week. And b- before we move on, I just, I, this is my only rant about that, is, like, Jordan Scarlett, to me, couldn't get a pass consistently forward. He just, it, 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 like, when Colorado Springs is on the attack, like, we didn't really get, like, the dispossessions. We didn't get the tackles and the, the things that, that would have created our own offense. A lot of it was just uh, clear, clear, just get it out, just move it, just get it out of the – please stop this offensive onslaught that's happening. Um, and you didn't see Scarlett rack up the tackles and blocks and interceptions that we were accustomed to. Um, Antley, I think – just looked lost getting beat in the air and on the ground one versus one. He, he even made multiple fouls. He just was not a very strong game for, for Connor Antley. Um, Guillen, I already talked about him getting smoked on that goal. And, and even he looking in the statistics, like couldn't get the long ball created. That's, that's what the whole point of the first half 11 was, is to create these long ball chances, create things on the wing. We, we couldn't do it. And uh, I mean, uh, if there's, I mean, Wyke was aggressive as usual. We, uh, I always talk about Lawrence White for good or bad is he's got a big motor in him and he moves. Um, yeah, I'm, so I guess maybe he's the best of the four, but even he got tangled up a couple times. So just things that we would count as strengths, things that we would count as um, uh, pluses, just this, they all fell apart. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of levy out the, a, a, a little bit of that all the way around, to be honest with you. I think you're dead on with that. I think that, uh, and I don't want to sound too harsh here because it's not like the Rowdies are doing poorly overall. Yeah. Obviously, we are third in the East, and we yeah. are still, yeah. you know, honestly, we are two or three results away from being able to challenge for the top. I I don't want to say that I think we are challenging for the top, but, you know, obviously, it could be that Louisville has a dip in form, whatever. So these are just possibilities yeah. that I'm referring to. But Look, I will yeah. say that this defense is not the same level as it was last year when you lose a guy like Forrest Lasso and Evan Loro of course something like that is going to happen but um yeah it it doesn't mean that these are bad players by any means Jordan Scarlett and Aaron Guillen have both been all league second team selections um it's 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 important to remember stuff like that because they are still very good players and Jordan Scarlett did not have a good game this past game it was uh it was you know down his right side, I think, in the first half that Haji Berry had the most success where he was going in like well deep behind our back four and he was receiving the ball in those channels because he had the pace to get there and nobody was really marking him effectively. It yeah. was also at least one instance in the first half where I believe it was off a set piece. We cleared one of their corners and uh, they took a shot, and the shot was deflected, so it goes a little wide. Then one of our players goes to, like, head it and heads it completely wrong, and I don't remember who that was specifically. I didn't have that name in my notes, but he heads it, and it falls into the box, and Jordan Scarlett goes to clear it, and his clearance is straight up in the air. It's I, I don't mm. know if you remember this specific instance, but mm. it was like no. a, it was a failed clearance. Yeah. And it lands at one of their players. They get a good shot off of this, like a very good chance. And I was just, that's not the player that we're used to seeing, you know? These are definitely yeah. these are definitely off nights, but to have two in a row and to have two at the level that we did, yeah, Connor Antley getting beat for pace and getting beat on the ground as well. It's one thing to go, you know, toe-to-toe with Haji Berry over a long distance. Sure. I don't know how many players are going to win that, obviously. <laughs> he, he would smoke both of us, uh, for sure. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. I mean, if you and I had a 50-yard head start, he'd still beat us across the field. But, um, yeah, like, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's fair enough to get beat by him over long distance, but it was also in between the lines that he would sometimes get there, and that's where Connor Antley, I think, thrives the most, is being able to anticipate those passes. He did not do so. 
And yeah, Aaron Gain and Lawrence Wyke, their passing all night was off. And I was looking, we'll get to this in a bit. I was looking to see at least who was going to get the man of the match. When I watched the game, I knew what the final result was. But I was getting, I was, I was, you know, always looking at least who's going to be my man of the match. And I'm trying to narrow it down. And I, I, you know, it's so, it's so hard because nobody had what would be considered a good game. And I couldn't go with Aaron Gein and Lawrence Wyke on their passing. And then by the end of it, I, I didn't feel like anyone on the defense had come near that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I, I hope uh, I'm a, I'm a I'm a new dad, right? So it's like this is my I'm disappointed. Like I'm not mad. Like like I'm not saying wholesale changes. Let, you know, like oh god, off with their heads. But I it, it just for two weeks now, it's been it's been a disappointing uh, just effort all the way around. And, and Neil even uh, you know uh, mentioned this too. He's like you know look, uh, he's very disappointed in the performance. So so. Uh, but I guess that's as good as any time to talk about man of the match. Uh, who who did you end up? There were two guys that I think had had plus. There were I, I two players total that I think had plus um, efforts on the evening. Um, but who James did you pick after looking at everything as your man of the match? Yeah, I did have to continue to narrow it down <laughs> as i said <laughs> um jan ecker and lewis holton i felt early on might be capable of pushing for it i didn't really feel that way as the game continued um leo fernandez was the only player that i felt did something positive but it still wasn't much as i as i said i think word for word earlier so i apologize for repeating myself but you know this is yeah. where we are uh if we continue to narrow it down I, there's only one player and that player was C.J. Cochran. C.J. Cochran stepped out and anticipated a couple of crosses, anticipated a couple of good chances for Colorado Springs, and he made himself big on those chances. He intercepted uh, one very big chance in the second half, and this was actually shortly before the goal, unfortunately. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so C.J. Yeah. Cochran was, by process of elimination and by uh, several acts of uh, his anticipating their ultimate strategy uh he was the man of the match as far as as far as i'm concerned you know um just for the sake of of putting positivity out there in the world uh that he uh you, you did name the two guys that had plus performances cj cochran 100 percent agree with you plus performance he made a huge save on uh, uh on uh, amo in in the 51st um he was always in good position he he um i mean even on the goal even on the goal, he had made a save and almost made another save as the ball just trickled across. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you're right. I mean, I mean, like even the goal was like if we would have just had a miracle, you know, like <laughs> something, a wind, a gust of of Colorado Rocky Mountain wind just come <laughs> through and, and help out my my guy CJ. Uh, it would have helped, but even before that, you know, six minutes before that in the 60th. Saved a dead straight shot after Aaron Gian got caught flat footed. Allowing a pass to the interior, Haji Berry uh, uh, gets that deflection, and and um, and uh, Cochran is in position and makes Haji Berry shoot that rebound, you know, high. Um, so, man, it, it this could have been, and maybe you know Neil thinks it, it might have been, it should have been more, but it could have been a two or three goal uh, uh, performance for the Switchbacks. But because of Cochran, it was not. So I agree with you. But in the sake, in the sake of putting a second player out there, uh, I'm going to go with Leo Fernandez. In the in the first half, he he penetrated with a great weaving play to earn a corner. You know, he you know he he, he couldn't get the the shot, but he earned a corner. Which at that point, we just needed anything and everything that we could get. And so he was. I mean, again, I, I thought he was killer as always on offense. Um, obviously he didn't score a goal, but I think he did everything but. In the 63rd, he created another huge chance with dribble penetration from the wing, and and it, you know kind of everything we want out of a out of a, a day on Harris uh, penetration. He was getting it done from the wing, made a beautiful crossing plat pass to Greg. Greg had the ball. And unfortunately, just kind of limply kicked it right to the to to the keeper. But um, Leo Fernandez, I'm going to say, is my man of the match to give a second rowdy a man of the match uh, of the week because um, I want to put positivity out there in the world. And we and I, the rest of the show, I'm I'm all I'm positive, man. So um, good on you, CJ. Good on you, Leo, uh, for being bright 
spots in an otherwise disappointing match. Yeah, I mean, w- what other way is there to put it? I think I think you hit the nail on the head, and I do like the I do like the uh, angle that we need to inject some positivity here. That's that's <laughs> that's what we got to do, right? That's my brand, man. I am like toxic positivity is what Ben Ben Whitelaw uh, says. He's the CEO of toxic positivity on Twitter. <laughs> I love it. Um, so so I'm I'm gonna follow in his footsteps here. I'm gonna be the positive guy for the rest of the show. <laughs> Well, we got to include that as well, for sure. So um, we will move on now with the rest of the uh, episode. But beforehand, I do want to take some time and say, of course, liking and subscribing to our show is free. We always ask that you do that. But if you feel like possibly you might want to help us out a little bit more and maybe look a little more stylish while you're at it, we would like to direct you to our team shop. That is shop.rblrsports.com. That is the RBLR team I'm referring to. And if you can, please check out all the designs we've got going on over there. Eureka has got some awesome stuff up on the site, and I think that you will like it too if you are able to look at it. And uh, if you do decide that you would like something while you're there, there is a promo code C-O-Y-R, you can take 10% off, and there will be a link in the description for the show. So please, again, check that out. I'm sure that you will like it. Now, uh, as we move forward, Eureka, if you could please take us through the standings update, and then we will jump into that preview. Yeah, you had mentioned it earlier. Uh, Louisville, we're hoping for a collapse, but uh, Louisville now leads now with 55 points uh, after 24 games. And Memphis now leapfrogs us into second with 51 points, 25 games played from them. We uh, are now third with our 48 points from 25 games played. So Loose City with a game in hand and uh, and a few points ahead of us. Uh, Not not looking good for for us uh, being atop the table. However... It's. Uh, I, I think our our good friend uh, USL Tactics John would would assume that we still have a 100 percent chance of making the playoffs. So it just depends where we're going to be. Uh, behind us, though, we have uh, Birmingham, Pittsburgh, the Miami FC, and Detroit City, who we who we just got done playing, uh, who have 47, 44, 40, and 39 respectively. So. Look, we're uh, Birmingham just sitting one point behind us. Uh, Pittsburgh, you know, one or two good results away from leapfrogging us. So we definitely have to, to be on our P's and Q's. Over on the other side of the planet in the West, San Antonio, our, our good friend Chris Hawkman has is, is got to be ecstatic. San Antonio leading with 57 points after 25 games. They have San Diego nipping at their heels at 52. Uh, we helped the switchbacks get uh, 45 points after 26 games. They're, they're sitting there. And then, of course, the rest of the West, New Mexico, Sacramento, Las Vegas, and El Paso round out the rest of the playoff spots. So, uh, unfortunately, one of those guys uh, that we saw that we saw in the playoffs was Orange County. They are not in the playoff race as of yet. And that is who's coming all the way to the friendly confines of Al Lang Stadium this week. We need some home cooking, man. This week, this two-week road trip, uh, two bad games, man, please. James, can we please get some home cooking for these guys? That's what I'm hoping for. We need to. We need the home cooking. We need the good luck charm that is <laughs> Al Lang Stadium. We need everything like that going in our favor. And, uh, yeah, let's get into the preview now. So, as Eureka just said, on Saturday night, the Rowdies will try – to right the ship against last season's spoiler team of champions and uh, the yeah the people who obviously knocked us out Orange County SC this is at home at 7:30 if you can be there please be there i will certainly be there along with my fiance and um, you know we got we got to support this team and cheer them on they are going to need it after what has gone on for the past two weeks of course and because yeah. they're playing this uh, this group of uh, let's say a-holes from out west. <laughs> Orange <laughs> County actually sit in 12th in the west. That is second from bottom with 27 points from 25 games. So they are not having a good season. And, uh, you know, who could have predicted that after they actually won last season? I certainly would not have. But um, yeah. their recent record is not that bad. It should be noted they have two wins, two draws, and a loss. However, I still say... Based on everything, we should be looking to smack this team to get ourselves back on the right track after these couple of games where, again, we have had two straight losses of 1-0 on the trot. So Mm -hmm. Orange County have um, 
I'd say a very interesting lineup. We can we can go with that. Uh, they have a mixture of old MLSers and some younger players who have been on the U.S. youth national teams in the past. So some of those older MLSers or uh, even national team players include Michael Orozco, Dylan Powers, Eric Torres, and Sean O'Coley. Michael Orozco has uh, many caps for the U.S. national team, and Eric Torres has, I believe, it's seven caps for the Mexican national team. Neither of them really hit the heights during those times, but obviously, you know, you have to be a very good player to still make those heights at all. And uh, I would say I was a big fan of Dylan Powers when he was in MLS. He was uh, possibly the MLS rookie of the year when he was drafted. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he still had a, a very good career before he dropped down to this level. Then uh, if you talk about the youth national team players, there is Alex Villanueva, Kyle Scott and Ian Hoffman, as well as a couple of others that we are going to get to. One of those uh, that we need to still get to is their best player for them this season. That has been by far Milan Eloski. He has a league leading 19 goals of which not one has come from the penalty spot. So uh, Eureka, this is, this is one of the guys we need to stop and put a, put some, uh, put some clamps on his legs. It's a whole different world in the West. Uh, I don't know. If, I mean, we, we, the joke is like, they don't play defense out there, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I, I haven't watched enough to say, Oh, you know, have all these been just Galazos and like, it doesn't matter who would have the defense would have been. Um, but if you have 19 goals leading the league and being in position for the golden boot here, uh, yeah, I hope are, are, I hope we're ready, uh, to, to, to mark this guy. Yeah. So Milan joined OC, uh, following his brother, Brian, who was already playing there. He had signed a home homegrown, homegrown contract with Real Salt Lake out of UCLA, but then he did not make the grade there. So he dropped down to Orange County and uh, he is an attacker who can take up a lot of different, you know, a lot of different positions and yeah. uh, make you pay in a lot of different ways as well. Uh, he often plays on the left and, you know, he will cut in off that left not necessarily the wing, but maybe in the half space there at the edge of the box and try and take up central spots. So uh, he appears to be able to both run at players, you know, with speed and with technical ability and try and beat you. But he can also uh, run onto a ball over the top the way that we saw Haji Berry do multiple times in this past game against Colorado Springs. So, you know, it's going to take a lot again to uh, to rein this guy in and try and shut him down. I, I think that we can do it, but um, we have to be able to do so from multiple angles and it, that's going to require a much better effort from our defensive unit. And maybe we have another guy back there to make sure that we have all of those angles covered, but yeah, it's going, like I said, it, it will have to take a lot more effort because of everything that he can do. And he plays a lot with Eric Torres, that former Mexican international that I was referring to, who uh, will often act more as a target player, even though he is about five eleven. So there's a lot of danger up top that we need to, um, contend with, but OC is still eminently beatable. We can beat this team based yeah. on their record. And I, I, you know, based on everything that's happened recently, uh, the fact that we're going to be at home, we have to beat this team and we have to like, in my opinion, we have to really hit them upside the head and, yeah. uh, and get ourselves back into the space that we need in terms of confidence. Yeah, look, it, when you look at their last games, I mean, it, it, they played Las Vegas Lights, Phoenix Rising, who is a disappointment this year, San Diego Loyal, LA Galaxy 2, who's at the bottom of the barrel. Um, they didn't do that well against Miami FC. It was a scoreless draw, but Miami FC is sitting mid midway through the Eastern Conference table. Monterey Bay, Phoenix Rising again, San Diego Loyal again, Loudoun United is a two-team uh, that they beat 3-1, but that's just kind of a battle of the... I mean, it, it's a two, it, All the two teams are bad, and they're uh, just slightly above uh, Los Dos. So it's... Look, uh, so maybe they're scoring a lot of goals against a lot of bad competition, but uh, this is definitely... Like, I'm trying to look at the... What's the... I mean, Miami FC is probably the best team they've played in over a month, but even, even before that... Um, I, they got molly whopped by Louisville City three one in June, and that's 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 the best team they've played in 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 over three months. So, yeah, on the road at Al Lang against a Rowdies team that absolutely should be hungry. Uh, I know Neil is probably not making uh, fruit baskets for everybody uh, this <laughs> week, 
uh, there, there's a lot to prove, and I fully expect that as as hungry as Ralph's mob is going to be, and the Skyway casuals are going to be hungry for a victory, uh, they're making it a fireworks night. They're doing all the things to get people in the stands. Uh, Neil definitely is is going to uh, take note of who brings that hunger out. So yeah, it's not. Uh, it, 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 beatable is, is, is definitely a word you could use to say against Orange County, but I wouldn't want to be the U.S. national team this week fl- if they were facing the Rowdies because uh, these are going to be a, a team full of hungry, motivated uh, men. <laughs> yes, I agree, and that is that is what we can all hope to see. So let's get into our predicts here, and we can let's go. try to see what we can expect from this game. Eureka, would you like to go first to put yours out there? Uh, no, I'll let you go first. You, you had your prediction out first, uh, and uh, uh, I will. And I, since I can actually see what it is in our notes, I'll let you go first so that it doesn't sound like I'm copying you when I say mine. All right. Well, I am fully expecting the Rowdies to come back with all the motivation they need, whether yeah. that is Neil Collins screaming at them for a couple of days or, <laughs> or uh, you know, the fan base with $5 beers and um, maybe, some, maybe some combination thereof. I am saying that we are going to stop Milan Oloski from scoring. And not only that, but we are going to score a lot ourselves. It is going to be a 3 0 gobsmack of this team. And that's what I want to say as well. Yeah, I went into I, I went into my uh, my analytical mode, and so I started looking up XGs and XGs uh, allowed away and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I came up with exactly the same thing you did even before I saw your thing, 3 nothing. But then when I saw that you put that in the notes, I was like, well, I can't. I can't copy you, even though I agree with you. I think it will be 3 nothing. But in the sake of competition and in the sake of I want more points than you, um, I'm going to say that, unfortunately, one goal gets by. I think it's going to be a 3-1 win. Uh, you know what? Let me just... 4-1 to the lads. 4-1 to the lads. Let's four go. One I'm, I'm, lads. Let's just do it. 4-1 to the lads. That's the, that's what my heart is telling me. You know, my green, my green and gold heart tells me 4-1 to the lads and... I want to see the return of Sebastian Guanzotti, please, please, <laughs> please, please. Can he get one of those goals? Maybe two of those goals, but uh, but please, 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 in front of a, a raucous crowd at Al Lang on fireworks night. Many, many fireworks, I believe, to be happening on the pitch beforehand. Four one to the lads. All right. Well, either one of those would be good in terms of points, and uh, yeah, well, that's what we're after, obviously. Got to get it on get the it. Uh, on the table. So. All right, that will do it for our predictions and our preview. Let's move on to our final segment, the extra time segment. And uh, there are a couple of points that we want to talk about here. So this next game could be Lucky and Kosana's 100th appearance. He would be the eighth eighth Rowdies player to do that on this list. Um, I don't know if it will be this game. Obviously, it will be the next game that he plays in, but I I am just super excited for him. I think that he is absolutely a Rowdies legend. And, um, you know, he would deserve to have his plaque up on the wall just as much as any any other player. Oh, absolutely a legend. Um, he, he, uh, Lucky M. Kasana is definitely someone you're going to say along the, along the side of Yamada, San Filippo, Savage, Pickens, uh, Yorgi, uh, Guinzati, Fernandez, Lucky. Um, I have I have quotation marks or, you know, around could be, it will be, he will be at home on the fireworks getting his 100th appearance uh, and and well deserved. I know I want to build statues for every one of these guys, but Lucky has been so integral to this team since he's arrived, uh, especially in the rebuilding and building of this team into the the top level uh, team that it is. Lucky is is absolutely been a cornerstone to that. And where would we be without the equalizer uh, last year in the Eastern Conference final? I mean, it's the it's the it's the greatest thing I've ever seen live, and uh, and he deserves all the praise. And I really, really hope that they're making a TIFO at Ralph's Mob right now for him. Yes, yes, absolutely. I would love to see that. Um, he obviously deserves it. So okay. we will uh, we will wait and see when that comes, hopefully in this game. So let's move on now to the next point. And uh, Hartford Athletic has actually named their new coach on there September 1st. We will have Tab Ramos coaching in the USL Championship. And um, Tab Ramos is obviously a U.S. men's national team legend. He has coached at several different levels, including the U.S. youth national team to a couple of FIFA World Cups at that level. 
Uh, he has coached the Houston Dynamo. I don't think that they achieved quite the results that the ownership group wanted there. But, I mean, I can't imagine that he's going to be anything but a top-level coach here in the championship. It's it's going. He's obviously got a lot of know-how. He is, um, you know, a very good analyst. I think he does a lot of the Spanish language, uh, uh, the Spanish language um, analyst jobs because he comes from the uh, Uruguayan backgrounds. So I, I, I think that there's going to be a lot going for Hartford in the future. It's probably a little too late. You know, maybe they'll make the bottom of the playoffs. I'm not entirely sure, but um, next season, I think that this is possible that he turns Hartford into a very good team. And you know, we'll have to see what they do in terms of. Uh, overhauling the team or, you know, keeping players on. But I don't know that I, I don't know how else to say it, but Tab Ramos is going to be a draw for players to go to Hartford. You know, that that's yeah. the way that it looks. Uh, yeah. Maybe they'll start putting the uh, second part of their name uh, into effect because currently uh, they're not very, uh, very much athletic. No. <laughs> Yeah, not not exactly living up to not only their name but the expectations of the fans. I'm out still there. I will bitter. say that I'm, I'm still bitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, now that takes us into our final point here. Juan Guerra, a former Rowdies player, uh, for yep. anyone who is unaware, he played for the Rowdies for several years, and in his uh, managerial career, he has spent time with Oakland Roots. He is no longer with Oakland Roots, however. He was uh, placed on administrative leave because that team actually found out that he was moving on to another team. And instead, mm. Juan Guerra has left Oakland Roots, and he has gone to be named the head coach of Phoenix Rising. And, uh, I mean, congratulations to him. I think that, you know, he obviously has a good platform to do so, to do good stuff there. I don't know how great his Oakland Roots track record is. You know, he obviously did well last season towards the end of the year after um, some pretty abysmal moments in the middle of it, but uh, or for Oakland Roots, it should be said. But, yeah, Juan Guerra, uh, we'll see how he's going to do at Phoenix Rising. They got rid of their coach recently, Rick Schantz, because things were obviously going very poorly this season, and Phoenix is not used to that as a club overall. So I think that he definitely has the potential to turn this team around. But, um, yeah, again, this might be a case of too little too late, at least in terms of this season that we're in right now. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it is good to see a former Rowdy doing good things out there. But, th yeah, the uh, coming uh, – fortunately, Oakland and Phoenix were able to come to, you know, undisclosed terms, uh, whatever that is that – like, I don't know, what do we, how do you make up for tampering? Uh, yeah, and I, I, don't, don't, I exactly, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I'm using the, the, the big T word, but, I mean, I don't know. There's been some a, a lot of uh, investigative journalism being done on Twitter about, like – are there actually tampering rules in the USL? The USL doesn't publish their their like rules of competition out there. Like, there's nowhere you can just go look this up. You just kind of have to shoot off a text message and hopefully get a response from someone inside the league. Uh, no one, as of yet, has been able to to to, to get that information. But uh, at the end of the day, hopefully, this has all been resolved. Hopefully, this is the end of a of a. Kind of a five-day saga that, from the moment that we knew that uh, uh, Juan was put on a, a quote administrative leave, uh, with and and literally Oakland saying this is on, the only thing we will say about the matter. It's like, well, of course now, like the spider sense goes up. Like, well, we want to know more. <laughs> like, yes, you, you, you can't just put out a press release and be like, and we ain't saying anything about it. It's like, oh, okay. Four days later, we we see uh, uh, Juan. Get, you know, uh, doing press conferences with uh, with his new team, uh, Phoenix Rising. So, uh, look, I, uh, we had a short little lived rivalry with Phoenix Rising because of our canceled USL Cup that we, we should have had. We and and hopefully uh, they bounce back because they've got a great fan base, very very passionate, just like we do here in St. Pete and, and Tampa Bay area. So. It's, uh, you know, hopefully we see the, uh, here's the corny dad joke, that we see the second rising of uh, Phoenix Rising here. There you go. There you go. Um, I should note, uh, Juan Guerra was only in charge of Oakland Roots for this 2022 season. He yeah. was not involved last season when they had that uh, comeback, but he was actually with Phoenix Rising in 2021. So um, we do have that in the notes. I just needed to make sure yep. that I got that out there as well. But yeah, he is, like I said, a former Rowdies player for uh, a couple of years there and, you know, made 
um, uh, 40 something appearances overall. I don't remember exactly what it was, but he was 45 for the Rowdies. Okay, there we go. But um, yeah, he's he's uh, a good player and a good coach, I think. And we're just going to have to see how it turns out. But um, yeah, that should do it for us this week now, Eureka. And I think that we are just going to move into saying uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Yep. I guess uh, my little foster kitten here has decided now is the time that he wants to start talking. So fair <laughs> enough. But um, maybe that's maybe that's our uh, cue to um, get ourselves off the stage. And uh, I will say, please follow RBLR Sports on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at RBLR Sports. And you can also follow me if you'd like at RBLR James K or Eureka, where could they get at you if they would like to? Uh, if you'd like to see the musings of myself, I am at Eureka RBLR. That's Y U R I K A R B L R. And of course, we would ask you to use the hashtag AskRBLR to get at us if you have any questions, if you have anything that's more uh, than questions. You know, maybe, maybe you have some. Uh, notes for the broadcast team maybe you have some some epithets to yell who knows <laughs> but um you can certainly get at us on twitter if you'd like with that hashtag now please like and subscribe to our podcast as well we are on spotify we are on the iHeartRadio app we are on apple and google Podcasts. we are also on youtube we are on all major podcast platforms so if you want to hear us you can get at us if you would like to now for one revenge game this weekend as well as fireworks and five dollar beers i want to say come on you rowdy thank you for tuning into this presentation by rblr sports on your way out of the stadium please remember to like and subscribe